Well, good afternoon. It's great to see everybody. On behalf of the Lovers Lane Foundation and the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment, welcome to the 2023 Owen Linton Lecture Series. We're very glad you are here. What a great turnout. The Lovers Lane Foundation consists of 48 permanent endowments that touch almost every aspect of the life of our church and all of its ministries. One of those permanent endowments is the Owen Linton Lecture Series Endowment. As you all know, the late Arch and Babs Owen are the founders of this lecture series. But more than that, Arch and Babs, probably more than anyone else, are, they're also responsible for really the very existence of the Lover's Lane Foundation. Babs and Arch joined the Lover's Lane a Methodist Church wasn't united back then in 1955, so what, 68 years ago. After our church moved to its present location, Arch began thinking that we needed a foundation primarily to uh, help maintain all the buildings that we were building here. So in 1981, he spearheaded the formation of the Lover's Lane Foundation as it exists today. Arch and Babs actually took turns serving as the board chair of the foundation. They rotated one after the other every two or three years, and the foundation never looked back, growing each year to where we are today. Today, our total assets are a little more than $24 million, and we project that we'll be supporting our church, its ministries, and its members this year with grants totaling well in excess of $600,000. In 1985, Babs and Arch launched the idea for a lecture series to be held during Holy Week, and they endowed a permanent endowment to fund what became known as the Owen Linton Lecture Series. For many years now, the endowment has funded the Owen Linton Lecture Series, featuring one or more speakers on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday of Holy Week. At this time, though, I'd like to, I, I know Arch and Babs are kind of looking down on us, smiling, knowing that the sort of the legacy they created is, is ongoing. And today we have a, a you know, special person in attendance for, I don't know how many years, um, Babs' good friend and caregiver, Meredith, who's here today, and Meredith's niece, Jennifer, is also here today. Would y'all mind standing so we could recognize you? Well, this year we're in for a treat. Our new bishop is our speaker, and his theme follows the sermon series we've been in the midst of, Lovers of God. So let's get started. I've asked Donna if she would give us an opening prayer, and after that, Mackenzie's going to read our scripture, and then Stan's going to introduce Bishop Sines. Oh, I'm so excited. Holy Week is here, and are we going to have an incredible and powerful week. Let us go to God in prayer. Oh God, we come to you with expectant hearts and minds, and we come open to Holy Week and all that it comes to bring to us. Open our arms up wide and help us to be ready to travel with Jesus emotionally and spiritually as he is betrayed and denied and arrested and crucified and ultimately resurrected. Help us to know that death is coming and that and to face the reality of the suffering that Jesus endured, that he went through, all the while trusting your plan and your way through all of it. And may we feel on a deep level the love for each of us and all of us that he showed through that death. Make us into your hands, your feet, your voices, following him to ultimate truth. And may our lives be so changed that we have to share this incredibly good news with all those around us. We're so grateful this week for our bishop, for his family, who has come among us. We are so grateful. We thank you for his spiritual leadership. And may we listen to the words that he brings us with a hunger 
to know more about you and to experience more of you. May our week lead to a whole new adventure in our faith. It is in Jesus' name that we lift this prayer, the resurrected one, and we say together, Amen. Please stand as you are able for today's scripture reading found in Luke chapter 19, verses 41 through 44. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, If you, even you, had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up rampant ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave within you one stone upon another, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I want to thank all of you for being here today. We've got such a great congregation for our our bishop. We're all looking forward to hearing from him. I do want to say uh, thank you so much to you, uh, Meredith, for being here and for being part of this this service today. That reminder of uh, Babs and Arch is so very, very real. And uh, Paul, thank you so much for your good work with your Uh, board of directors here. I see many of them here in the congregation from the foundation. You know, I want to say one word before I introduce the bishop. I want to say a word about the foundation. Um, I've been here 25 years. When I got here, bishop, the foundation was kind of like Bruno. We don't talk about Bruno. Now, the bishop and I understand this because we have grandchildren who watch Encanto. And, you know, don't talk about, you ought to see my little five-year-old and, and two-year-old uh, when they start talking about Bruno. Oh, we don't talk about Bruno. And we didn't. And we had about $2.2 million under investment. And we didn't want anybody to know we had any money. We didn't want to talk about Bruno. But, you know, the strategy shifted with the board that we needed not only to talk about the foundation but grow the foundation because the growth of the foundation meant growth of ministry and outreach Uh, that would continue, not just taking care of the buildings, but certainly that, but so much more. And I think Paul Ditto and the work of the foundation right now is just incredible. And the way that y'all lift up the ministries of the church in such a fantastic way. So we talk about Bruno these days, and uh, and may the foundation just continue to grow, and that's because of your generosity. Bishop Reuben Sines, Jr. is a native of South Texas and a lifelong United Methodist. He was elected bishop in 2016 here in the South Central Jurisdiction um, and served the Great Plains, which was basically Kansas East, Kansas West, and Nebraska all coming together. You'll kind of like this theme, all coming together, maybe ahead of its time. I think now we can say about the Great Plains, it's probably the strongest conference in the jurisdiction, except for North Texas, of course, but nearly a thousand strong in churches, um, barely lost any churches to disaffiliation, uh, huge reserves, and ministry going, going, going. And I want to say that a large part of that had to do with the leadership of the bishop who now is our Episcopal leader in the North Texas Conference, and in the Central Texas Conference as well. The Bishop Sines worked with the Central Texas Conference over the past uh, months uh, when the bishop there retired. Uh, bishop Sines came in and brought great stability and grace to the table, and we are so very thankful for him. Bishop Sines is a graduate of Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, He's a former high school teacher, high school football coach, business person. He earned his master's degree in divinity and a doctor's degree as well from Perkins School of Theology right here in Dallas, Texas. He served congregations in East Dallas, in El Paso, in Edinburgh. In fact, uh, the, the church in Edinburgh was the largest Hispanic American 
uh, United Methodist Church in the country. And his conference that also merged with the Rio Grande Conference and the Southwest Texas Conference to form the Rio Texas Conference, I know that Bishop Signs was very important uh, to helping that uh, coming together happen. And so we have one in our midst who has quite the track record of seeing conferences come together and their vitality growing and their outreach increasing. And I know that that's what we're in store for here, even though he's only been with us a few months. We can see what's coming, and it's exciting. In 2010, he was appointed to serve as the South Texas Director of Congregational and New Church Development. That might come in handy. Those skills that he had and brought to the table then will come in handy when we start forming churches all over the North Texas and Central Texas and Northwest Texas Conference as we see our church expand. He started 11 new churches in that uh, period of time when he served in that role. It wasn't a very long period of time, but it was extremely productive. And then he became the Rio Texas Conference's Mission Vitality uh, Center uh, Director. And um, in January of, of 2015 is when he took on that role. And he didn't stay there long because we elected him a bishop. In 2016, he took over the post uh, in the Great Plains. Bishop Sines enjoys drawing and painting landscapes in various mediums, in endurance, cycling, and intensity training, fishing, and golfing. I might can get in on a little fishing, but... And also, he loves Aramaic-flavored coffees, uh, coffees from all over the world. And enjoy sitting down with a cup of coffee and probably talk in church. And other things. Maybe even grandchildren. Because he and Maya, who uh, come to us, have four adult children. Uh, they are all lifelong Methodist and very active. Two of his sons, Aaron and Reuben III, serve as pastors in growing congregations in the Rio, Texas Conference. And he and Maya, they have nine grandchildren. So today we're honored, truly honored, to have Bishop Sines speak to us for the very first time. It will not be the last time. We'll have him tomorrow and also on Thursday, but we'll have him into the future. Because his time here, I don't know that there's ever been a more important time for Episcopal leadership in our denomination. And the right Episcopal leadership is so very, very important. And you only have to read Bishop Sines' resume, his bio, to know that he has the experience to take us places that are going to be so very exciting to see the church grow, to see disciples made for the transformation of the world. And when you hear him speak, I know he's preaching today, when any time I've ever heard him speak, I've always gone away. So inspired by his vision of the future. He's a visionary. He not only wants us to know what we do in our mission, but he wants us to know where we're going. And I love the way he casts that vision of what's the church going to look like in 2060. Let's build to that church. So it is with great humility that the Lover's Lane United Methodist Church says, welcome bishop and let's give uh, the bishop a round of applause. Thank you so much. Uh, well, the grace and peace of Jesus Christ be with your spirit this afternoon. I bring you greetings from the Council of Bishops and the 12 million United Methodists and the 400 and plus churches from the North Texas and Central Texas conferences who are helping people to grow deeper in their love for God, who are proclaiming new life in Jesus Christ, who are finding ways to serve others, especially the poor, and doing the work of justice. I'd like to recognize and also celebrate um, the vision of Babs and Arch Owens, the first presidents of Lover's Lane United Methodist Church Foundation for creating the Owen Lenten Lecture Series. Lenten has been a very important part of my spiritual life, I guess ever since I was in seminary. Um, that's when I really claimed it. I was, I was raised in South Texas, and uh, most of my 
most of my classmates and most of my community was Roman Catholic and I was one of two Protestants in the whole high school. And so, you know, they, every time Lent came around, the whole community was actively engaged in, in food and the culture and, and the, and the uh, worship services and so much that was happening. And I was kind of an outsider always looking in. And when I got to Perkins, I started to study the work of the uh, priests as they came into Mexico and started planting churches uh, in the northern parts of Mexico, especially uh, Fray Margil de Sanchez, who was a Franciscan priest and made seven trips from Mexico City to Louisiana first. And then once the French came into Louisiana, he went to San Antonio and he uh, established the San Antonio missions. And, uh, and now we all know him as, as Father San Antonio. Um, he had a practice of, of, um, of using the, the stations of the cross in his daily walk. And, and he did that every day, morning, noon, and night, as he traveled back and forth, and he had a lot of experiences. But he drew his strength from observing and learning from the courage, the humility, and the love of Christ during the Passion. And so ever since that time, I've always really focused my my understanding of what it means to be a Christ follower by really focusing on the passion. And Lent gives me an opportunity to do that. Every Lent, I always go into what, what I call my own personal spiritual journey. And uh, since I started practicing, well, since I started as a bishop, I've always invited the rest of the conference to join in. And I never know what I'm going to discover. But every time I enter Lent, I know that I'm going to come out on the other side different because I've encountered the love of God in Christ again and again and again. Um, and watch him as he endures so much suffering for, for the love of us. And so Lent is a, is, a, is a blessed time. I'd like to thank Dr. Stan Copeland for the confidence that you have in me and for inviting me to this, um, to this honorable place and time in the church. Um, Stan, I, I appreciate that. And I'm, I want to expand on what it means to be a lover of God, who follow, who understands the Sabbath, uh, who are sent, who are grateful, and who are humble. I will admit that once I saw the scriptures that you've been preaching on during Lent, and I saw the ones that were left for me, I'm like, really? I get the ones with the destruction and everything else? <laughs> and the second coming, and Jesus coming in the clouds, and, and, and I said, okay, well, okay, let's see what the Lord can do with these. Uh, so I'm going to give them my best shot, okay? How about that? Um, so I'd like to further expand on this important theme for Holy Week by exploring what it means to be lovers of God who weep, lovers of God who withstand and hold on to their faith in the midst of trial and tribulation, and lovers of God that watch, watch with hope. Lovers of God who lift up their heads when things seem to be going off the rails. Let us pray. Shine within our hearts, loving God, the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our minds and hearts that we may understand and embrace the message of the scripture. Amen. The late Reverend Billy Graham attributed uh, the Gospel of Luke with being the most beautiful story ever written. That's what Billy Graham said. If you ever want to discover the most beautiful story ever written in the history of humanity, read the Gospel of Luke. I can understand why. Luke is the most literary of the Gospels. It has all kinds of stories and parables and vivid demonstrations of events. Who can forget the woman with the issue of blood who reached out underneath all of the traffic and to touch the hem of Jesus' garment and the power went out from Jesus and Jesus says, who touched me? It provides a unique focus on Jesus' compassion for the poor, for the marginalized, and for the outcast, and the role of women in the early Christian community with the stories of Mary and Martha and other women and other female disciples. Its emphasis on forgiveness, mercy, and love make it particularly moving and inspiring. It includes some of the most memorable passages in the Bible, including the story of the Good Samaritan and the prodigal son. 
and some people would rename it the prodigal father. Luke and Acts, although separated by the Gospel of John in the Bible, is a two-part story that begins with the birth and infancy of Jesus and ends with the unfinished story of the church. Luke and Acts is one book. It's a unified whole. And the Bible is separated by John. And Luke ends abruptly in chapter 28. And the message is, the work is not yet finished. Continue to take the gospel to the ends of the earth as Acts 1.8 demands. Little is known about Luke, the author, and, but we do know that he was a physician. All of his references to healings of Jesus, Jesus gave way to show his medical knowledge. Um, he is the only Gentile to write any part of the New Testament. Now, listen to me again. He's the only Gentile to have any scripture in the New Testament. Luke does not name himself in either of the books, but Paul mentions him by name in three epistles. Luke dedicates his gospel and the book of Acts to a certain we don't know if it's a person or just a general Theophilus. Theo means God. Philo means love. Lover of God or someone loved by God. Theophilus. Dear Theophilus. Theophilus literally means loved by God, but could also mean friend of God or lover of God. There are many theories about the identity of Theophilus. One theory holds that Theophilus was a high-ranking Roman officer or a high-ranking official of the Roman government. Another possibility is that Theophilus was a wealthy and influential man in Antioch. Yet another theory is that Theophilus was the Jewish high priest named Theophilus ben Ananus or a later high priest named Mathetes ben Theophilus who served in Jerusalem in A.D. 65 through 66. And finally, one of the theories that's, I think, gaining a lot of traction is that Theophilus was a Roman lawyer who defended Paul during his trial in Rome. If this is true, then Luke Acts can be understood as a legal brief used for Paul's defense. We cannot know who Theophilus was with certainty or if whether Theophilus was a person or representative of every believer and lover of God throughout the centuries. But we can be sure that Luke wrote the story of Jesus and the church so Theophilus and Christians throughout the ages could more fully understand what they already believed and know that the things that they were taught were indeed trustworthy. Further, Luke's gospel and the story of the church see the knowledge of Christ's saving grace reaching to the ends of the earth, as Acts 1.8 demands. So the gospel of Luke has a literary structure. Can you, can you put the, 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 the slideshow up there? Oh, it's small. Anyway, um, the first part of Luke's gospel is about Jesus' infancy and narrative. How Jesus was born, the announcement of Mary, and Jesus taken to the temple. The second part is Jesus' preparation for ministry. His baptism and his encounter with Satan in the wilderness. The th part three is Jesus' ministry in Galilee, the northern part of Israel. The fourth part is Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. He's in Galilee, and then Luke 9, chapter 51 says... And then Jesus resolutely turns his face to Jerusalem. And then it takes Jesus 10 chapters of Luke to get there. Uh, but nevertheless, Luke marks that beginning, that turning towards Jerusalem as the beginning of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, which ultimately culminates on what we know as Palm Sunday. And then part five, and the part that I'll be focusing on is part five, which is Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. 
And then that's followed by the passion narrative, which begins with the Last Supper and the passion. And then part seven is the resurrection narrative. So we look at, at, at the structure of Luke. It's, you, you, can, you can understand where you are in Luke's chronology by, by looking at the different chapters of Luke. Luke. Luke is a historian, and so he has a lot of names and dates so that anybody who wants to, to verify that what he's saying is true, they can go back and see, oh, yeah, Caesar Augustus or Herod or, or, or whatever. These people were actually here at these times. And so Luke wants to set an orderly account. Not, not that he's dismissing other people. He's just, he, he just wants to, he has his own people and his own audience that he's dealing with. And while Matthew's genealogy goes back to Abraham, Luke's genealogy goes back to Adam. And then it culminates in Jesus, in the resurrection of Jesus. And then it begins the church and it moves out to the end of the world. So it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a cone <clears throat> that starts with, with, with Adam and, and, and finishes in Jesus and then opens up again and continues the work of the church. And, and so Luke... Luke has got an objective when he's writing. He's not just writing. He's really trying to tell a story. Um, <clears throat> this Holy Week talks will focus on part five of Luke's gospel, Jesus' ministry in Jerusalem. By the time Jesus gets to Jerusalem for Holy Week, he has already told his disciples three times that he will undergo great suffering, be rejected by religious leaders and killed, and on the third day be raised. <clears throat> he, his, his ordeal to fulfill everything the prophets wrote would include betrayal, arrest, a mistrial, mockery, insults, flogging, and crucifixion. And unfortunately, his disciples, like many of us, cannot always understand what Jesus is trying to communicate. Uh, and they were afraid to ask him about it. You ask him. No, no, you ask him. We don't want to ask him. So before entering Jerusalem, Jesus sends off two of his disciples with instructions to bring him a colt. Now, it's not a horse. Think of it, it's, a, it's a foal of a donkey. It's like a little donkey. Uh, What's the disciples do? And then his disciples mount Jesus on the colt. Jesus doesn't get up on he, He's mounted, right? And so all these details in Luke are trying to tell us something. And they evoke an image of the awaited humble king spoken of by the prophet Zechariah. Jesus' disciples acknowledge that, that Jesus is the Lord and king and then throw their cloaks on the street. Now, in the, in the gospel of Luke, there are no palm branches. They're just cloaks thrown on the street. It's, 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 a, it's a distinction that, that Luke makes. Luke has got another idea in mind. <clears throat> and and the, word, the word cloak, to, to throw a cloak on the street, was more than just an act of honor. This was also acknowledgement and declaration that Jesus was the King of Kings, the promised Messiah. Go to the slide. <clears throat> the, the word cloak in Hebrew is a name of a tallet or a prayer shawl. So these were Jewish men who had their prayer shawls. And when they saw Jesus coming, they took off their prayer shawls and they threw it on the floor. <clears throat> and, and the tallet was a seamless garment with four corners with a tassel attached on each of the four corners to remind the Jewish people of all the commands of God. When we went to Israel, when, when I flew to Israel from New York to Tel Aviv, I sat next to some Orthodox Jews and they were reading the Torah with the shawl um, at the appointed reading hours and praying the Torah and wrapping leather around, around their, their, their wrists to bind themselves to God. It was really amazing to watch the, the spirituality uh, of these people who were searching for God in the, in the Torah. Upon the collar, the Hebrew letters spell Lord of Lords and King of Kings, a symbolic reminder of the promised Messiah. So by laying their talent down, the people acknowledged Jesus as God's promised Messiah. They declared that Jesus was worthy to be called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. 
in Jesus, their prayer and hope for Messiah had been fulfilled. This is an interesting um, right. What's his name? Wright in Paul and Autobiography um, says that Paul did not start a new faith, a Christian faith, that Paul was able to understand Jesus as the fulfillment of, of the promised Messiah. And so although he was not starting a different sect for Paul, Jesus was a fulfillment of all the scriptures. And, and, so, and so Christianity was, was then separated, but, but it was never distinct from Judaism, it was a fulfillment of, of, the, of the expectation, of the messianic expectation. <clears throat> so as Jesus begins his descent from the Mount of Olives through the Kidron Valley up to Jerusalem, his disciples cheer and praise God for all the acts of grace, healings, miracles, and liberating acts they had seen them perform. When the city of Jerusalem came into Jesus' full view, right, I, I didn't understand this until I went to Israel, and then you realize that the geography is the fifth gospel, because you realize where everything is located in proximity to each other, and it's, it's not far away. But, but there is a picture of Jerusalem from the, ta- the, for, from, from the Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, of Gethsemane is before that. You can't really see it, but that's what Jesus would have seen. That's Jerusalem. That's the full view of Jerusalem. Okay, and, and, so, and so some of it is rebuilt, and of course the Temple of Solomon is not there anymore. Now you have the Dome of the Mosque in, in the middle. But Jesus would have seen that from about two miles away. And so Jesus comes down the Temple Mount through the Kidron Valley. This, this is important. And then he ascends, and Jerusalem was built on a mount for strategic purposes. So somebody attacks, it's, you can fight, you can fend off your attackers from, from a high point down. And so... Jerusalem was a temple, so it was impenetrable, and the walls were enormous. We'll talk about the walls tomorrow. <clears throat> and so when Jesus saw that, he began to weep. Now, Matthew and Mark and John don't, don't say that Jesus wept, but, but Luke does. Luke is the only one who says, now, in, in John, Jesus weeps at the grave of Lazarus. But in Luke, Jesus weeps when he sees the city in full view. So what's, what's going on here? <clears throat> um, it is notable that Luke is the only gospel that mentioned Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Jesus weeps with sorrow because the people will reject him and his teachings and he weeps with compassion because he knew that people were heading for destruction. So it's interesting that when, 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 the, when the temple wall was restored in the 19th century and they started digging to, to unearth it, they found an, an incredible number of, of tombstones right outside the eastern wall, dating back 500 years before Christ to 70 years. And so Jesus was literally walking over tombstones as he entered the eastern gate, Right? And, and one of the gods says, which one of the prophets have you not killed? Well, he was walking through a cemetery, which is very, so he, he knew what he was walking into, which, which makes the journey into the heart of Jerusalem even a lot more courageous. And, and, so, and so Jesus is, is probably stepping over or sidestepping some tombstones getting there. Because in those days, the people would, would bury themselves outside of the walls of Jerusalem on the eastern gate because they believed that when Messiah would come, he'd come from the east. And when Messiah would come, those on the east would be raised. And that's why a lot of our cemeteries, if you look at them, the tombstones are always facing the east. They never face the west or the north or the south. They're facing the east. So... So that's, is that the east? Yeah? So, so all the tombstones are facing the east. And, and there's a reason for that. It's not just because, you know, they're, they're, that's the way it happens. There's intentionality as to how we bury our dead with a tombstone facing the east most of the time. I'm sure that in cities where things get more crowded, it might be different. Uh, <clears throat> so, so Jesus is going through there. He's stepping over tombstones. He's weeping. He's crying. And he's, he's crying because 
He's brokenhearted because they're going to reject him. And, and he's brokenhearted because they're going towards destruction. And as much as he wants to stop them, they're bent on it. And, and, and so Jesus' weeping is complex. Like a lot of our weeping. I mean, think about when we cry. Why do we cry? Sometimes we cry because we're brokenhearted. Sometimes we cry because we're angry. Sometimes we cry because we just feel sorry for somebody or, 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 or we hear something and, you know, and, and it causes us to weep. And so weeping is never a simple matter. It's always a complexity of emotions that are colliding with each other. Or, and so, and so Jesus' weeping is mingled with an unwavering and everlasting love and care for the people along with tremendous frustration grief and anger and a deep yearning for peace reconciliation and welfare of the people which they reject <clears throat> Luke mentioned that some Pharisees in the crowd told Jesus to get his disciples under control perhaps fearing political repercussions and, and raising the ire of Rome but Jesus would not Jesus declares that the rocks will fill the void of praise if people do not praise and honor him as the king of kings that enters his capital city. No one can stop the praise of Christ. And if we look at scripture, right, it, it, it's hyperbole, but there's many passages in scripture where the mountains and the hills clap for joy and, and the trees and, you know, you have all creation praising God. And so it's part of the, the imagery of, of, of the creation praising the creator. And Jesus says, if these people don't talk, the rocks are going to do it. But nobody can stop the praise of God. And, and, so, <clears throat> and so Jesus continues on with the journey. When he, when he enters Jerusalem, the disciples with him shouted praises, but the public in the city did not. Now there's two groups. Those who are coming with Jesus are his disciples and followers, and those in the city don't really receive this band of merry people that are coming in. Now, now the, the people are kind of neutral. They, they receive Jesus, but, but, but the people that are walking with Jesus in, in, the, in, in the procession, they're not the ones that are going to turn against Christ. It's the people in the city who will be turned. Sometimes we, we just mix everybody, everybody. No, the people that were with Jesus were walking with, and according to Luke, they're, dis they're differentiated from the people in the city. So these people were praising and worshiping, and these people were like, what are you people up to? And, and, so, and so you start to see what, what, what is happening here, according to Luke. <clears throat> and, and, um, and Jerusalem was at a pivotal time, and Jesus was bringing God's peace, and yet they did not recognize it. And, or they did not recognize that God was visiting. They completely missed it. If Jerusalem had recognized Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah, things in the city could have gone in another direction, but instead the people did not take appropriate action. Rejecting God's peace and missing God's time could have far-reaching implications and devastating effects on lives, on nations, and yes, even on the church if we miss it. Jesus always talked about do you not see the signs of the times you know when it's going to rain but you do not see what God is up to I think that's one of the things that scares me the most is really not understanding what God is up to because if we don't understand what God is up to and join God in that we're going to miss it and we don't want to miss that as a church the signs of God visit according to Luke are this these are the signs number one worship changes Number two, politics are challenged. Number three, economies are made just. And number four, temple prayer and transformative teaching is restored. Now let's take a closer look at these four things. When God visits, worship changes. Worship goes from being business as usual, and it becomes spontaneous, jubilant, and passionate. God is in our midst, and God is worthy to be praised. When worship changes, God's presence is palpable. Sometimes people go to church and you say, I just feel the presence of God is here. I feel the Holy Spirit is here. Some people have walked into church and they'll just start weeping because they know that, oh, 
This is, this is a holy, something is unique about this atmosphere. The atmosphere is different. And so there was an atmosphere of worship and praise, and some people got it and some people did not. So when, God's, when God uh, visits, worship changes, God's, presence, God's transforming power is available, and God's providence is possible. When worship changes, people experience God's goodness and mercy and forgiveness and love. Surrender their hearts to God and say, here I am, Lord. Use me. Send me. Something, God is at work in lives and God is mobilizing people to do God's will in the world. When God visits, worship changes. When God visits, politics change. But not overnight. <laughs> and believe me, not without a struggle. Justo Gonzalez in his commentary on Luke says that even though Jesus will not seek to depose the Romans and Jewish authorities, the triumphal entry scene is politically charged. There's politics involved. Judea is part of the Roman Empire. No one can claim to rule over it without the support of the Roman authorities. Yet Jesus' disciples loudly proclaim him as king. It's no wonder that the Pharisees wanted to silence him. Politically, the Pharisees the Pharisees are caught. They have the zealots who want to create anarchy and, and break away from Rome. And then they have Rome, whom they benefit from because of the peace and the freedom that they enjoy. And the Pharisees are trying to keep both of them in tension. So they don't support the zealots, but they value the measure of religious and political freedom that they had and they sought to prevent anything from arousing the ire of the Romans. Like, can you keep it down? We don't want to awaken the Romans to what's happening here. When God visits, politics change. I was doing some research as to why people in power don't like to give up their power. And some of the comments were that <clears throat> Uh, people in power that might start out with good intentions to serve the people eventually becomes corrupt, right? Eventually they start looking to see how they can serve themselves or the constituencies who put them in office. And they start looking after the well-being of the people and they start enjoying the benefits of their position and status so they don't want to relinquish it because relinquishing the position would mean that they do not have the benefit anymore. Some of them just feel indispensable and they think that, that the party or the or the group cannot work without them, so they want to stay in to be able to influence the direction and make big decisions. And so, while people come into power, sometimes when that power is threatened, people can do some very strange things, and they can try to hold on to it by whatever means are necessary. So we don't know what's going on here, but it seems to me that the people that were in power were feeling a little nervous about this new person who was being claimed to be king. And they were caught in between. <clears throat> when God visits, economies are made just. The first thing that Jesus does when he enters in, he goes right to the temple. The procession leads him right to the temple. This is what Alexander the Great did when he conquered Jerusalem. He goes into as a mighty king on a white horse and he goes right into the temple. And Jesus goes, goes at it in a donkey and he goes into the temple, but, but differently. And then Jesus purifies the temple. And, and one of the first things he does is, is he, he, he corrects the economic injustices that are happening. <clears throat> when God visits, economies are made just and solutions are found that create payment of fair prices and wages. Safe working conditions and reasonable work hours. The elimination of child and forced labor. Balanced trading relationships. And for us now, environmental sustainability to take care of the creation. When we start to think about the way that our economies work and, and the good about it and the injustices, what does it make God weep? Would Christ weep at some of the things and some of the practices that we 
that we participate in knowingly and unknowingly when we buy goods and services that are oftentimes created and manufactured through the exploitation of others or, or, or others' properties. We don't think a lot about that, but I think Jesus weeps. When he sees people working 50, 60 hours a day making $20, $30 a week trying to make ends meet, <clears throat> while the profit margins for corporations keep on going up and the cost of goods and, and manufacturing keeps on going down. I think Jesus weeps. When God visits, economies are called into question. And of course, all this costs money and redistributes and and reduces profits for businesses, which in turn creates tension between the owners and the employees. And so when God visits, things get a little bit disruptive. When God visits, temple prayer is restored and transformative teaching is restored. When Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the first place is right to the temple. When he arrives at the temple, he purifies it of corrupt economic practices and then starts to teach in it every day. Justo Gonzalez again comments that unlike other gospels that acknowledge in some way a growing plot against Jesus, Luke's Jesus is teaching every day in the open. It's like not even paying attention to what's awaiting for him. I don't know about you, but if I had one week to live, I might not be here today. <laughs> teaching. I might be with my family or my kids or playing golf or fishing or doing something else, right? Trying to get the most out of life. And, and yet Jesus was there teaching about God's ways till the very end. He was teaching every day. And then he said he'd go out at night and go back up to the mount. And we'll talk about that tomorrow. <clears throat> Jesus loves the temple. Luke, the temple worship is very important to Luke. Jesus is taken to the temple as a child. Jesus, Jesus is teaching in the temple at night. And then, and then the disciples in Acts chapter 3 are going to the temple for prayer when, when, when the man, the, the, the lame man says alms and he says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And so temple worship is very important to Luke. He's talking about the people and how important that is in their life. And so Jesus loves the temple in Luke. It's God's house. And it's meant for prayer and communion with God. But Fred Craddock says, gradually a beautiful place and its witness to the sovereignty of God had lost its way until Jesus came along who loves both God and the temple enough to purify it. The people hang on Jesus' every word and they thoughtfully consider what he was teaching even though some of them just didn't get it. As a result, the leaders of the people, threatened by the justice and reversal of things Jesus was doing and teaching, wanted to kill him. Spontaneous worship of God, the challenge to oppressive political power, the disruption of unjust economies, the teachings of God's love and justice that undermine the status quo, create anxiety and push back. And this confuses us because we think that if God is in it, everything's, everyone's going to be happy. Everything's going to be easy. Everything's going to be peaceful. But if God is in something, disruption and change ensues, often threatening our familiar ways of doing things, our powers and our structures, our economic interests, and our normative ways of living. So of course, there will be pushback to the change God brings about. And here's the thing, some well-meaning people who benefit and like the order of things as they currently stand will find themselves fighting against God when God's change impinges upon them and confronts them in their ways. And Jesus weeps. because people reject him and his teachings. He weeps because he has compassion for all of us and knows we will all head for hardships when we do not recognize the things that make for peace or the time of God's visitation. As lovers of God, may we, like Jesus, also weep with sorrow for those who reject Jesus and his teachings 
and weep with compassion for those that are heading away from God and God's peace. Let us pray. Compassionate Savior, as we look out over our cities and read the daily news or hear about what's going on in them, we see so many in desperate need of your forgiveness, compassion, mercy, and love. And yet in our own strength, we know that there is little we can do without you. We are shy and we're timid. Increase our faith, we pray. Pour upon us your overflowing compassion and boldness to pray for our cities and to work in our cities so that your peace and your glorious gift of abundant and eternal life will be made real. Amen. So tomorrow, we're going to explore what it means to be lovers of God that withstand the pressure to stumble and fall in faith because of trial and tribulation. Thank you. Thank you so much to our bishop. Let's give him a You know, one of the benefits of the lecture this year is that it is the prelude to a 72-hour prayer vigil that we have here at Lover's Lane. And if you hadn't signed up yet, you can sign up. You don't have to be a member of Lover's Lane. We need all the prayers we can get. And we're going to be praying about renewal and reconciliation. And so um, you'll have an opportunity to do that today. We'll have a sign-up sheet out there, and this prayer will begin after the lecture on Thursday at 1 o'clock. Uh, will be when this lecture, uh, in, this uh, prayer vigil begins. At this time, I'm going to ask Paul to come share some comments with us about uh, about lunch and probably other things. things. All right. Thank you, Stan. Wow, thank you, Bishop. That was an amazing message. Um, speaking of weeping, I, I was weeping yesterday. I don't know if any of you were here for the spectacular organ recital that Katie did for us. And the theme of that was, you mentioned the Stations of the Cross, the theme of that was the Stations of the Cross, which if you look around the room on the pillars, all the way up here front and down there are the 14 Stations of the Cross, all painted by local artists commissioned for that organ recital uh, just yesterday, most of which, most of them are members of our church. So after lunch, come back down here and kind of walk the Stations of the Cross. There's a little commentary below each of the paintings. So thank you all for coming today. I know that Arch and Babs are looking down on us right now with a big smiles on their face that, that they see this legacy continuing that they created. Um, Couple of reminders, we're having a sit down buffet lunch in Watson Hall. Watson Hall, if you look on the walls of Watson Hall is our Art Beats Gallery, which uh, we rotate art shows. That's another endowment that the foundation does. Uh, we rotate art shows on like a 60 to 90 day basis. The current show is one of our members, Cece Turner. Uh, on one wall is her art from Texas. On the other wall is her art from Colorado. So. When you're eating lunch, look around and kind of enjoy that. And don't forget, we'll be here tomorrow, uh, same time, same place, noon. Uh, you know, today we learned about um, lovers of God weep. Uh, tomorrow we'll learn about lovers of God withstand. So will you stand as you are able and join us in our closing hymn for the healing of the nations, hymn 428 in your hymnal. And then I'd ask at the conclusion to Bishop if you would close us out. Thank you.
And now, friends, may the love of God, the peace of Jesus Christ, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit go with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Thank you.